If this game were played today, the chat room would be going crazy with accusations of cheating against Bobby Fischer's opponent. This game was played in 1959 before chat rooms and commentaries, live commentaries, before the existence of modern computers. Computers, I don't even think you could find a computer rated 1,000 back in 1959. But Bobby Fischer's opponent in this game plays shockingly well. His opponent is Edgar Walter. Now, he's a 2250 level player, but that's like a 2800 almost, playing a 2250. And as this game progresses, it reveals a lot about human nature and how we respond to games, how we respond to accusations and so forth. Very entertaining game. Let us jump right in. Edgar Walter has white. Bobby Fischer has black. He begins with E4. Bobby Fischer plays C5. And very quick, quickly, we have Bobby Fischer's favorite, Sicilian Nydorf, on the board. Uh, the idea, of course, is to keep the knight out of B5 and maybe expand on B5. And Edgar Walter plays the sharpest line. It still is the sharpest approach. Bishop to G5, uh, already threatening to take on F6 and allowing White's knight to jump into the D5 square. This is very, very sharp stuff. E6 prevents the doubling of pawns, keeps the knight out of B5. F4 expanding in the center. Bishop to E7. Bobby Fischer's uh, favorite move later on would be this idea, queen to B6, the poison pawn variation. But here he plays a more traditional main line with bishop to E7. Queen to F3, basically played against the move B5. If white were to play B5 here, then or black were to play it, then E5, attacking the rook at A8 and the knight at F6. Knight B to D7, long castling, and queen to C7. This makes B5 possible because if white plays E5 here, bishop to B7 would be defended by the queen. Bishop to D3, B5, and now bishop takes F6. Also, rook HE1 is a, a more common move. Bishop or e5, bishop b7 would be strong for black. But bishop f6 uh, clears the way, gives up the bishop pair, but it clears the way for the g-pawn to advance all the way to the g5 square. Knight takes f6, rook h to e1. Uh, Walter has everything centralized, and Bobby Fischer's king is still in the middle of the board. Bishop to b7, and now king to b1, an important precaution played by uh, Walter. And here, Fischer thought he should have played this move, b4. Then after knight c e2, g6 to help control the f5 square, g4, e5, knight b3, d5, and knight to d2. Um, Fisher thought he should have done this, and the computers do say that black is a little bit better with just a huge mess in the center of the board. But Bobby Fisher plays the move rook to c8. Now, so far, both sides have played fairly common theory, uh, even though the position is sharp. g4 with the idea of playing g5 and kicking Fisher's knight back to the d7 square. Fisher preemptively plays that anyway. He plays knight to d7 with the idea of maybe possibly going to c5 and attacking the e4 pawn. g5, continuing to gain space. Walter wants to perhaps play f5, f6, or maybe take on e6. And here Fisher plays the move knight to b6, which makes some sense visually. The idea is you can play b4 and the knight won't be able to run to a4 and blockade the pawns. Uh, but this is in fact a double question mark move. Uh, the better move here was still b4, and after knight c2, knight to c5, and here we have an equal position. Uh, and this is where uh, Master Walter begins to just make one brilliancy after another. I mean, stockfish level, boom, boom, boom. And modern computers completely support his moves. I mean, it is, it is, it is Kasparov Magnus level chess for an extended period of time by this 2250 level player, just astonishing. First he begins with f5, or still, still a natural move. Um, if Fisher plays b4 here, then fe6 is just, would demolish Fisher. If he takes the knight, then ef7 check, king d7, queen g4, forcing the king back, knight e6, forks and wins the, the queen. So he can't allow Walter to take on e6. So Fisher plays e5, problem of course is that does weaken the d5 square. And again, Walter ignores the threat to his knight. He plays the move f6. Doesn't worry about uh, the knight at d4. If that knight were taken, then this move would follow knight to d5, hitting the queen, the bishop, but also the knight at b6, really forcing knight takes d5, ed5. And then we see rook aiming at the pinned bishop at e7. The game is over here. Fisher wouldn't, could, even Fisher could not survive this position. So instead, he plays gf6. 
but then gf6, again, forcing uh, the bishop to move, bishop to f8. So now, certainly, Walter will move the centralized knight. Nope, he sure doesn't. He plays a much stronger idea. Knight to d5. He just keeps piling on these sacrifices and, and brilliant moves. And, and if we were, again, watching this live, this is when you'd start to see in the chat, Stockfish, Stockfish, who does this guy? Who is this guy? You know, but it played in 1959. Knight takes d5, ed5. Notice the pin along the e file keeps the knight at uh, d4 from being captured and king to d8. Modern computers give white a plus six advantage at this point. That's the same as being up two minor pieces, or up a rook and a pawn. A, a huge, huge advantage. So, does Walter let up? No. He plays another exclamation point move. Knight to c6 check. The idea is that after the knight gets taken, the central files will open up for his two rooks. Bishop takes, pawn takes, Queen takes, and now, at least my computer, Stockfish, gives white plus seven in this position. Bishop to e4, uh, opening up the d file and hitting the queen with tempo. Queen to b6, and now queen to h5, aiming at this vulnerable f7 square and pawn. The king goes to c7. Uh, queen f7 check was probably best here, but the move Walter played is also very strong. Bishop to f5, aiming at the rook at c8. Rook to d8, queen f7 check, king to b8, queen to e6, setting up another trap. White's actually setting up this move, rook takes e5. And he couldn't retake it because there would be a lateral pin after takes. He takes the queen with check. And that, of course, would be uh, the end of the game. Uh, so Fisher steps out of that lateral pin with queen to c7. Rook to e3, Walter continues his strong play, aiming the rook at c3. Bishop to h6, attacks the rook, and then black also connects his own rooks. Rook to c3 hits the queen, queen to b7, and now f7. In addition to all of the attacking possibilities, the open lines, Walter also has this dangerous f-pawn that Fisher has to constantly deal with. Bishop to g7, rook c to d3, aiming at the weak pawn at d6. Computers love these moves. It's really... It, it, to, to play this many strong moves in a row, from a 2250, it's just unheard of. It's just unheard of. Bishop to f8, and now is he done? Nope. Queen takes e5. <laughs> Another sacrifice of, of the queen, which uh, Fisher does take. Rook, uh, bishop ta a pawn takes queen, rook takes d8 check, king to a7, and now he does recover the queen with rook 1 to d7. That's why the queen capture at e5 worked. h5, rook takes b7 check, king takes b7 c3, king to c7. Now, before this king to c7 move, excuse me, get that back, Fisher said in his book, My 60 Memorable Games, that he, he, was, almost, he was about to resign here. But he said he just wanted to see uh, what Walter was going to do. And this is a very important point. Uh, Fabiano Caruana, who's a current super GM, said once that he always suspects his opponent is cheating online, not when he gets a great position. He says, that can happen to anybody. Grandmaster doesn't play the opening that well, they get in trouble. That happens all the time. He suspects cheating when that player then plays, like, just locks in that advantage and doesn't let go of it, because that's where it really gets hard. We've seen many strong players get in bad positions and come back and win. So can Walter lock in this advantage? Fisher wants to see. Uh, rook to a8 was played here. Rook to e8, by the way, Fisher said he would have resigned after this move because there's nothing he can do. The, king, the black king is blocked out by the rook and bishop, and the white king just marches forward, and there's simply nothing a black can do. Uh, but instead, he plays rook to a8. King moves here. Again, rook to e8 is still best. Walter plays rook, takes a6 check. Now, these are good, but not quite as great moves as what, what he was playing. King to e7. Rook to e6 check, king takes f7. Well, now a dangerous pawn is off the board. Uh, white is still clearly better, but uh, not by as much as he was. Rook takes pawn. Uh, he, he is up two pawns against Fisher. b4. Um, now here, Fisher said, at this point, he began to think there could be some tricks that might allow him to save the game. Pawn takes pawn, bishop takes b4. Now, 
I'm not going to pretend to fully understand this endgame. It really is above my pay grade. But there are two things to take note of in understanding what Fisher was seeing. One, he was seeing this bishop and this h-pawn and this wrong queening square at h8. So he knows there's that possible formation with king against bishop and pawn with a mate, I mean, I mean a, a stalemate uh, at it, coming at, at h8. He also sees that you have bishops of opposite color. So he realizes if he can blockade the a and b pawns on dark squares, the color of his own bishop, and create a situation where his king can always get back to the h8 square, he has a chance to hold this position. h3, king to f6, rook to b5, bishop d6, now bishop to e4, um, a4, uh, rook b8, bishop takes. Uh, Fisher believed this was black's best chance to draw. Uh, and my computer does show zeros after this, so apparently this is a, a holdable, a holdable endgame. Uh, bishop to e4 was played instead, a better move. Rook to f5 check, king g7, bishop f3, rook to e1 check, king c2, rook to f1. What Fisher wants to do, he wants to exchange rooks. He realizes that his best chance is an endgame without those rooks on the board, where you have opposite colored bishops and you're dealing with this h-pawn. Rook to d5, Walter knows enough to avoid that exchange. Rook to f2, but now king to b1 was, was a key idea for white. Bishop a3 was black's best chance, but uh, after pawn takes, obviously creating two rook pawns is the idea there. The rook takes bishop, rook takes h5, rook takes a3, and white is still winning uh, in this position. But here Walter plays rook to d2. He hasn't given up the win yet, but he's made it that much better for Fisher. Rook takes d2 check, king takes d2. A white is winning, but now he has to be very careful how he advances these queenside pawns. They have to be advanced so that black cannot blockade on the dark squares. h4 is played, a key move, keeping this pawn at h3 for the moment. King to d3, king to f6, king c4, king to e7. And uh, this is an example of the kind of resilience and extraordinary endgame knowledge someone like Fisher and these top players have. And in this position, white has only one move to win the game. And uh, it's a study-like move. The move is b4. And here, after the bishop g3, white can win this by preventing a uh, blockade. He plays the more natural move, uh, probably the move I would play, uh, king to b5. Um, and this takes away the win. Now with perfect play, black can hold this endgame. But King to d7 was a mistake. The key idea was bishop f4, playing bishop to e3 and blockading the dark squares along that diagonal. Uh, king to d7, but here b4 is still the right move, but he plays a4. And now king c7, b4, king to b8. And Fisher is using the king and bishop to try to, again, blockade these pawns on dark squares. And having these opposite colored bishops really helps. a5, king to a7, king c4, bishop g3, b5. Bishop to f2, controlling this diagonal. If he plays b6 check, then you would actually be able to just give up the bishop for the two pawns, and then you just march. But the king would have to come back to get that pawn, and then you have the textbook draw here with the wrong rook pawn. So he can't play b6 there. So he plays bishop to e2, bishop e3, king b3, bishop d2. Now b6 check, king to b7, king a4. He wants to play the king to b5, which would be winning, but king to c6 keeps the king out of b5. Bishop to b5, check, and now king to c5. And after b7, bishop to f4, controls the queening square, a6, king to b6, and we can see Fisher has established control over those dark squares, keeping those pawns from advancing. Black has everything blockaded and has a draw. Basically what happens is, he holds these pawns with his control of the, of the dark squares, and if at any point Walter wants to come over to the queen side and win over here, Fisher can advance his own king over to this square, and Walter will never have time to capture the h4 pawn and advance his own pawn. So after making brilliant stockfish-like moves for like 10, 15 moves in a row, he still is not able to win against the great Bobby Fisher, a revelation of Fisher's strength, and a revelation of the role of computers and when we should be and should not be suspicious. Thank you for joining us at Chess Dog. See you again soon.